Hello, I'm the Grub Street Lodger and I've just got back from the British Museum where I went to an exhibition all about, it was called Feminine Power and it was all about goddesses and demons and witches and things and I picked up a cool coaster of, uh, well it's the Queen of the Night is what it's called, but it's probably, possibly, maybe Inanna, who uh, as well as being uh, a fascinating mythological figure is the name of the main character in the book I'm writing, so... I thought maybe that would train my mind on it while I'm writing it. And also, it's a heavy-duty coaster, and I spill things a lot, and I seem to get through coasters, of all things. Well, there you go. Anyway, that's got nothing to do with um, whatever the month before. May. May. It's calendar there. Nothing to do with May's reading. God, I'm rambly today. This could either go very well or very badly. So, May's reading. What month theme was it this month? Well, it was Leon Garfield month. And in fact, I have now read all the Leon Garfield. There is no more Leon Garfield I can read. Uh, which uh, is sad, you know. If I read any more, I'll have read it before. It will never be new to me again. Uh, he's given me a lot of joy and pleasure over the years, especially during lockdown. If you look, watch <laughs> my, my videos for sort of the worst of the COVID times, there was a lot of Leon Garfield. Uh, the downside of there being so much Leon Garfield, um, of, of this being the last of the Leon Garfield, I mean, is that this is kind of the dribs and drabs. So I started with this here, which is The God Beneath the Sea, and it's by Leon Garfield and Edward Blishen, who was a teacher who wrote uh, sort of memoirs of working in rough uh, London schools in the 1950s. And they connected on how much they love Greek myths. And it's a retelling of Greek myths, particularly uh, early kind of ones, Theogony and the Titanomachy uh, and things like that. So um, early stuff, you know, the, the, the birth of Zeus and, and Kronos eating his children and Zeus getting them you know, th thrown back up and all of this kind of stuff. Uh, the God Beneath the Sea that's referenced is Hephaestus, who... Uh, was born of Zeus and Hera, was hideous, so they threw him in the sea, and he was raised by sea nymphs, including Thetis. Uh, and he's told the backstory of all these gods. He's not really the main character. I suppose Prometheus is the main character. I didn't know, for example, that Prometheus made people in the myths, or the version of the myths they've chosen to tell here. So people were made by Titan, not by uh, Olympians. Uh, and he's kind of the hero because he really puts himself out for people and, of course, he ends up getting captured, chained to a rock and having his liver eaten out every day. So it doesn't end so well for him. As you might be able to tell, the, the, the sort of the, the linking through story is kind of loose in this. Um, it's not really very tight. Uh, there's kind of a, a thing about people and about their their fragility compared to the might of the gods and how, how light and, and insignificant people are. And that's kind of interesting. Uh, and how some of the gods keep an eye on us and some really don't. Uh, and then it, it leads up to teasing of the Trojan War. Um, the style's interesting. It kind of reaches for the poetic. It tries to be poetic and when the book came out some people loved that and some people thought it was very badly done. I personally think it, it works because I think Leon Garfield, I mean I don't know who put that bit in, Leon Garfield or Blishin, but I know that Leon Garfield has a way with similes for example. He's very good at an unusual simile. There's a great bit in this about uh, crabs uh, crawling along with, with miniature cities on their on their backs like all the growths on the shells and stuff so I don't know. It was it was a good retelling. Um, it, it was probably the most fun retelling of ancient Greek myths I've read. Yeah, you know, it, it put a bit of literary flair into it. it. Didn't just say this happened and this happened and this happened, but at the same time, it, it didn't twirl around and get lost in itself. So, um, I mean, it won it won the Carnegie Award. It, it was a very influential book of, in its time, but uh, like most of Leon Garford, it's kind of been left left aside but I thought it was pretty decent if you want a nice sum up of uh, um, sort of creation 
myths of Greeks. And, oh, and there's a there's a flood myth there. I didn't know the Greeks had their own flood myth. Yeah, God Beneath the Sea is pretty good. The second book is The Golden Shadow, which is also by Leon Garfield and Edward Blish. And I've got it in this sort of slightly naff print-on-demand version. This is better than the other one, though it didn't win the awards. It's, it's tighter, it's more human-bound. So it's principally the story of Hercules... And one of the things I really like is how it really puts into context that the labours of Hercules aren't Hercules going around doing these wonderful things and showing off. Uh, it's him paying amends for a terrible act that he does, you know. And and by the end, Hercules is uh, is a slave in drag uh, in a court and he's being humiliated and kind of accepting it because he feels it's what he deserves. And, and then he gets... Um, revivified and he actually frees Prometheus so he goes back to Prometheus from the last book um, also another grounding factor in it is that the stories uh, are linked by this storyteller who is the <laughs> the storyteller of the first book and he is someone who whose faith in gods and goddesses is going he feels he lives in a post god world even though he lives in the golden age of heroes but he just misses Hercules he he just misses this, he just misses Thetis, he just misses that, the other. And um, it's only when he dies, and he sees Dionysus, who's doing this psycho pomp him about to take him down to the underworld, that he goes, oh, I'm so glad I've met one of you. And it's like, oh, you've, you've met him because you're dead, mate. But he had a role in inspiring Hercules to free Prometheus. And it, it's a much uh, tighter book. Um, the stories are better as well, I think, because they're more sort of heroes and those kind of stories than 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 the the slightly stranger uh, origins of the god type ones that were in the other book. And this again, the storytelling is really good fun. It's not pompous. It's not stiff. This is good. Uh, a golden shadow. Uh, I would recommend that over company to see. Okay, the third Leon Garfield is called The Captain's Watch. Now, this is from a, a trilogy called uh, Boy and Monkey, uh, written for long-ago children's books, which was this thing, which very well reviewed, by the way. Yeah, they got reviews in The Times and all sorts, uh, a series of children's historical fiction. And uh, the first one was a little slight, uh, but... But still quite fun. Use some good uh, sort of puns and things about a small boy and his monkey, and they end up getting caught for thieving, and they get sent down for transportation. The third one, if you remember, was the terribly racist book, where he doesn't understand why the slave hates being a slave, but they end up escaping together. This is the second one. They're on the boat. Things keep going missing, including the captain's watch. Of course, it's the monkey. How's the boy going to get out of it? Um, and that's 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 what it is. And it's, it's yeah, again, it's... Good. Leon Garfield very rarely sort of phones it in. So he, he puts so much more effort into this tiny story than it deserves. And there's this great bit about uh, they've got lots of people singing hymns in the ship. And... Uh, uh, and it, it says that the the ship had so many hymns, it was so holy that it could have sailed straight to heaven if it wanted. And just little things like that. Um, this was really hard to get, by the way. This was the one that was the hardest book to find. Uh, partly because this is the only edition it's in. The reprints don't have it. Uh, have it. But also because there's uh, another Leon Garfield book, Blue Coat Boy, which is sometimes titled The Stolen Watch, and you... Get mixed up with your captain's watches and your stolen watches and what have you. So the fourth of my books is kind of by Leon Garfield. It's a selection of short stories that he not only has picked, but he's kind of commissioned them off people. It's called Baker's Dozen. Uh, there's one by him as well. Uh, good names in here. Philippa Pierce of Tom's Midnight Garden. Writes a, a kind of nice slice of 70s life thing. Nothing particularly... Uh, gripping. Alan Garner of um, Elidor fame. He writes a really creepy one called The Flying Childer, which has flying children in it. Uh, Joan Aitken, uh, if you've watched all of these, you'll know I love a Joan Aitken short story. She writes one about this woman who gets lost in this uh, 
part of London that doesn't really exist, but it does in the book. Uh, and in getting lost there, she finds herself in hell, and that makes her think about how she's connected with people all these years. Uh, that's pretty good. It's called Hope. Um, and then some of these are a little bit strange. Um, I'm just sort of looking off here. I've got try, uh, Don't Try to Take a Taxi to Go to Paxi, which is by Edward Blishen, the person who, who worked with, uh, Garn, uh, with um, Garfield uh, on the Greek books. And it's just a word game. It's just a description of a word game. Um, yeah, it's, in all, it's quite an interesting snapshot of early 70s children's literature. Um, Leon Garfield's One Strange Fish is a very interesting book, a very interesting short story about uh, wreckers, people who live on the coast who purposely lure ships into the rocks so that they can, uh, they then kill the people who wash up and then steal the, the goods, uh, which actually links to some books we've got coming up but that was yeah that's quite a fun book and there's a really interesting thing where, about um redemption and whether these these uh these records have been redeemed or not uh short answer they haven't been but hey it's, it's really good uh but the best thing in here is leon garfield's introduction in which he basically slams children's fiction he says, look, when I was, uh, well, you yeah, know, long ago, when I was little, books were just books and you read whatever kind of books you wanted. And if you're a kid, well, you just had to make do with what you got. Um, but now we've got specific children's books and the marketing for children's books. And, and, and some of them are very good, but most of them have the stringency and bite of a wet nappy. This is because so many authors imagine that a young reader is not only simple in his tastes, but also simple in his mind. They write as though for three-year-olds who are able to read, and not very bright three-year-olds at that. Well, very young children are catered for quite adequately by their mothers, as a rule, who tell them such stories as will widen their eyes and then close them in a happy sleep. But mercifully, there are still some writers today who write for the joy of telling such a story as those who will delight to read it. And then that's what he says. He says he's, he's got the best writers. We got the best writers. Here comes another one by Leon Garfield. Shakespeare stories. I'm, you, you know I'm really scraping the barrel here. I've got the scripts of the animated Shakespeare. I didn't read them because I watched all the animated Shakespeare instead. Um, and they are very good summaries. Shakespeare stories is predated that. You got the, the animated Shakespeare gig because of this. And it's, it's literally what it says. It's telling the stories of Shakespeare plays. Trouble is, the stories of Shakespeare plays are probably the weakest part of them. Right? Uh, you, you go to Shakespeare for the characters and the characterization, and he, you know, he knows how to make a really good scene, uh, or you know, the, the beauty of the language or what have you. The plots, not so much. Um, this was further let down by the fact that I have been in, have seen, or have read every single one of these plays, so there just wasn't any surprises. Um, the best thing about them is to see where Leon Garfield is coming on, on sort of the um, the more mm, troubling aspects. So you've got Merchant of Venice and he managed to really finely balance uh, how much you sympathise with Sherlock and how much you think he's a twat. Or you've got The Taming of the Shrew where he, he tries to construct a relationship between Catherine and Petruchio out of what's there, which I find is really hard. I think it's just a tale of abuse. And then, what a brave lad. He even tries to tie the Christopher Sly thing into it thematically. He's very good at bringing out the themes. He uses a lot of the speeches in, in there. Like, if if you want to get a kid into Shakespeare or, or get a kid to understand Shakespeare, this is good. But if you already kind of know where you're at with it, it's a bit redundant. <laughs> ah. Yeah, you know, there's nothing. It does what it does very well. It's just it's not for me. So I was really delighted when the the next book was Shakespeare Stories Two. Ah, there's another one. But however, this one there were some I didn't really know. Uh, one was Measure for Measure, which I'd seen and hadn't understood a word of it. So reading this was like, oh, that's what was going on. That's cool. Um, and again, for you know, Shakespeare's comedies are the weaker ones. So. Explaining as you like it to me was quite handy, and comedy of errors, which is really rough and slapsticky. That's a way more slapsticky one than the others. Uh, same as Shakespeare stories. One really, it's um, 
it's a very good thing, but I don't have much use for it. And then that was it. That's the end of the Leon Garfield. So I, I moved on to something else. I was given Winchelsea by Alex Preston. And the first thing I have to say about this book is, why is the cover like this? The colours, pink and, and, and purple and this sort of twirly W thing. It looks like a Wonka bar. It's a story about smugglers, but it looks like a Wonka bar. Uh, and, and to be honest, that, those, that problem with the cover sort of carries on throughout. It claims to be a book written in the 18th century, but it doesn't even feel like a book set in the 18th century. There's such a 21st century sensibility about the whole book. Um, so in the very first bit, Goody, our, our uh, protagonist, and that annoys me for a start because Goody's not a name. Goody is a title. It's short for good wife. Goody Two Shoes is her nickname. She's called Marjorie and, and, and she's a wife and she was delighted because she's had one shoe all her life. And when someone gives her another shoe, she goes, oh, I've got two shoes. So she got the nickname, you know, Mrs. Two Shoes because she's so proud of it. Goody Two Shoes. And then our phrase be a goody too. She's come from the fact that she's also good. But anyway, so goody, not a name. Anyway, she writes uh, sort of a letter to the reader uh, in which she says, um, you know, this has turned into a novel, but it's all true story. And she has this confident assurance of what a novel is that someone writing in her time period would not have. And then she says, oh, and a lot of it I, um, I narrated to a man. So if it sounds like a man writing a woman, that's why. And it's like, no, no, it's because it is a man right and a woman. Don't try and fiddle faff out of it. Don't bring it up if it's something you're conscious of. Especially at the beginning of the book. And then, I mean, she lives a lot of it as a man anyway. Um, yeah, and then it's all these chunks and they don't really fit together and they're all narrated by different people and they don't feel 18th century at all. Uh, a, a couple of people in this book festivate Let's go and, and festivate. That's not an old word. That's a word that no one's ever used. Uh, it's just somebody else goes, oh, that is of the mo mode. And you're like, do you mean a la mode? You might as well, you know, somebody of your class and status would have just used the French. You wouldn't have badly translated it. Uh, and everyone drinks porter because porter sounds like an old fashioned drink. It's just, yeah. And, and. This 21st century sensibility really leaks into uh, gender things that are in it. So Goody lives as a man for a while, as a man called William. And one of the chunks is narrated by someone he's with or, or she's with. Because actually Goody ends up becoming uh, most comfortably non-binary. So it's like they're with. Um, and that person that, that Goody is with narrates that Goody is a man, discovers that Goody is not, you know, an AFAB, as we'd say, you know, a born man, uh, but carries on using the pronouns, which, you know, is very polite nowadays. It's just not very 18th century. And the whole concept of gender um, is not understood in the way an 18th century person would. There was lots of cross-dressing and living as other genders in the 18th century. There were men uh, in the Molly houses who, who had female sort of selves. Some even lived in them permanently. There are lots of stories of women becoming uh, female husbands. I've got a book about that I haven't quite read yet. You know, you've got the, the pirates, Anne Bonny uh, and Mary Reed, who lived as men. You've got Charlotte Chant, the actress, living as a man. This did happen quite often, really, but they wouldn't have conceived of it that way, and it uh, just if it felt immature it felt that that it couldn't it felt like it was holding our hand and going don't worry well i know we're thinking about a long time ago but we'll walk you through it nicely there's something fake about it theme parky plasticky it wasn't it wasn't real. It wasn't a real story about smugglers in the 18th century. Uh, and then what's more, uh, th they get double-crossed by two bands of smugglers, and by the end of it, they're like, and now we live happily as smugglers. And you're like, smugglers have ruined your life. Why are you, why are you even doing this? Like, It's just weird. Weird. Um, the book came about 
as a what if we wrote an adult moon fleet? So I read Moon Fleet to see what the not adult Moon Fleet was. And it's way more adult than Winchelsea, I have to say. Um Moon Fleet, much more mature. Uh just brilliant. I love Moon Fleet. Each chapter is this really well constructed little thing, and then the chapters go well together. One of the things about Winchelsea is that it just rambled and then went to Jacobite Revolution. That Moon Fleet you got this thing, and it's really exciting, and then it leads to this thing, and it's really exciting, and so on and so forth. And there's some really great set pieces. There's this bit where they go down in a well to find a, a hidden diamond. Uh, there's some smuggling acts in it. There's um, there's this horrible chapter where they're all uh, in a prison for, for ten years, and each little set piece is fantastically described and created. And it's a, each chapter is just this little nugget, and all the nuggets are strung along beautifully. Uh, it's very exciting. It's about this guy called John, who's a uh, just about to turn sort of manhood, and he uh, he he stumbles across these smugglers, and he becomes friends with them, and he becomes a smuggler, uh, and things go a bit wrong uh, because this guy called Maskew. And, and how he's built up as a villain, but how he's not completely vilified is really, really good. Um, and and then um, somehow in, in all of this, they've there's a, a hidden treasure, this diamond, and they, they, they search for it, but the diamond may be cursed, and even if it's not cursed, it might not be the best thing to do and go get this diamond. And it's really, really good. Um, <laughs> This month's not been great, and uh, and I'm sorry, Leon, because I love so much of your stuff, but I I did leave the dregs <laughs> till last. So the last of your stuff was just the the slowest, and then Winch will see. I didn't like so. This was really fun. I really enjoyed it. I hope next month's going to be a little bit better, and it's going to pick up more. The theme for next month is uh, non-fiction books about aspects of the book. So we'll see where we go with that. Have a lovely day. See ya.